Hello, and welcome to Mac Gamecast, episode 19. We will talk about a bunch of fun stuff today. You'll have to listen and find out, because this is being done in reverse editing. And with I'm John, as always, and today with me is Ted. How you doing? Doing well today. Thank you. And Lily Kitty is also here, or Lily Fox, so um, Vex, whoever we want to be called. I have I um, my many names. <laughs> yes, the lady of many names. Uh, how are you also doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you. Hooray. Thank you very much. Seeing as we've run out of like games to talk about, we might as well just turn mm-hmm. into like a bread podcast. Okay. You know? <laughs> with, uh, with lessons by Ted, the senior, senior uh, baker, dough master. And, I wish, uh, yeah. yeah, I wish I was a master. I just picked up a few things over the years. That's about it. I'll, yeah. be, your, I'll be a junior assistant. I'll tell you one thing. Talking about games, I was, I, you know, like it. It was kind of funny. I we were talking about our Apple Arcade, and because um, I bought the uh, iPad, right? Yeah, and and I got free three, you know, free three, three month trial. So I figured yeah. oh, I'll take a look at. It. But there's not much left in there at all. I'm really surprised. I thought you could get almost anything that Apple Store sold, but apparently, ah, it's, no, it's its, its only, own. Yeah, it's its yeah. own curated library. Yeah, it's its own library, which I didn't realize. And the other mm, thing is, interesting. Okay, you can do. You know, it also gives me the ability to do it on the Mac, <laughs> as well right. as the iPad, which I, you know, kind of dawned on me after a while. And uh, but you know, there's just there's even less for the Mac, especially since I have an Intel one. So, <laughs> well, uh, as far as I understand, the service is meant to work across iPhone, iPad, and your Mac. And right. All the games should be compatible on all three platforms. I'm pretty sure it's yeah. separate. It's completely separate. It it functions through the App Store, but at the same time, it's completely separate from it. Right. Um, I believe. Maybe there's some exceptions, but most of the games in there, I think, are exclusive to Apple Arcade. You can't just go and buy them on right. the App Store itself. And in some cases, they've even got a couple exclusive games um, that I think are literally nowhere else. But, right. you know, it's not some... Hey, it's a Lily. Um, hey, I lo- hi, Lily. Welcome, welcome. We're just talking. Well, we were talking... You missed our discussion on bread. You could have become like a certified... <laughs> Breadmaster from listening to Ted for like five minutes, but you missed your chance. Um, I absorbed a little sure knowledge. I'll again. Yeah. Well, you could just, you know, listen to the start of the podcast because I have been recording oh, and I'll okay. probably include some of it because we segued <laughs> right into gaming stuff. Yeah. You came at a great time. Um, we haven't officially introduced the podcast, but I'm trying to do more like pre roll stuff, I guess. Uh, I've noticed of other podcasts I like to listen to do that sometimes. Not like, Set tons of it but a little they kind of hey how you doing how's your weekend what's going on or whatever um and then maybe launch into the gaming stuff but ted was just telling uh well, i was gonna say us me now us uh, <laughs> i'm more than one person um about some apple arcade experience um and some uh misunderstandings he had with it i don't know if that's too harsh a word yeah, um, that's, that's good yeah yeah um, but it's true. Um, well, that's the thing. You know, it's the eternal problem, right? Of, I feel like this is a more magnified version of when um, console and PC games started to be made cross-platform mm-hmm. back around when was it heavily happening? Kind of around when the first Bioshock came out, so maybe two thousand seven or something like that. Um, yeah. Before that, there. It's not that there weren't any games on both like say xbox and pc due to microsoft sony's kind of at its own market still does that that's those walls are being coming down um they're porting a lot more they're big flagship games to pc but anyway um i could tell because i remember very distinctly i don't know what the first game i noticed it in it might have been bioshock it might have been when i was running a hacked version of halo 2 on my buddy's Windows laptop. I hacked, I mean, we were running it on Windows XP, and it was you're supposed to be running it on Vista, so we found, like, some workaround, because <laughs> we didn't want to deal with Vista. Um, and it was so consoleized. The menus, the movement, the aiming, oh. everything was just like, oh, my God, this is horrible, coming especially from, <laughs> like, say, Halo 1, which I'd played on the Mac extensively. 
or even uh, games like Bioshock, which I love, I could just tell, oh, this was clearly designed from the beginning with controllers in mind. And yeah, ha- as in, it wasn't a PC game ported to console or console game ported to PC. It was a hybrid development from the start. And I could tell there were certain limitations coming from the last five or ten years of gaming that games are just purely made for PC or Mac. You know, I mean, PC, I mean, PC and Mac for computers as opposed to consoles. The menus were different. The UIs were a bit different. The controls, the complexity it was, and honestly, it was a big turnoff to me. And the reason I'm re- mentioning all this is because I feel Apple Arcade has similar constraints in that it's first, it's actually first designed for iOS and iPad. Those have to be the parameters. It has to work on those systems and then within those UIs and everything. Of course, you can play it with a mouse and keyboard, but any games you play are always going to be limited by the fact that it also has to work on an iPhone or an iPad. Like, can you imagine if all game development was like that? The kind of games we'd have, it'd be like, oh my God, no. So it, I think it's a really cool, you know, we've been talking a bit about um, on the show a little bit, like, does Apple care about gaming? Or maybe perhaps a better question is, how do they care about gaming? Because they do put a little effort out there. They do have Apple Arcade. They do feature plenty of games on the App Store and, like, the rotating banners and stuff. There's always a game or two up there. They have big gaming sections. They have, like, editor's notes on gaming in the App Store. So it's not that there's no effort. But, you know, it's, again, like, what do you consider? You know, are you, are you going to, like, I'm, I guess I, I, would hesit- I would hesitate to say or go as far as to say, like, I'm an elitist. To me, it's like, none of these are real games. <laughs> yeah. Right? That's, They're like, that's a yeah. very elitist thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm um, in the same boat. <laughs> so it's like, you know, okay, it's there, but since the quote unquote not real, or they're not quote unquote real games, um, by which I mean they're not like medium to heavy games in terms of like weight rating, they're all lightweight um by the nature of the design because they have to be because they all have to work on an iphone and an ipad now you could say okay well they're porting heavier stuff now like feral um they just announced they're porting alien isolation to ios and ipad i think next month you know um and they've been porting all kinds of stuff xcom xcom 2 the total war Rome, and a couple others so they're taking like big older games, mind you, but still like big AAA games and porting them to smaller devices. I think that's really cool. So if mm-hmm. Apple were to include those kinds of games, I don't mean every like every single ca- item in the catalog, but at least some of them. They don't include any of these. If they were to include some of these bigger games, I think, you know, it would gain a little more respectability, a little more interest because there's a reason people pay for these big game passes from Microsoft and Sony and whatever it is, Xbox, Game Pass, Sony has PlayStation Store, something, I don't know what it is. Um, you can just pay a certain amount a month, 20 or $30. Uh, Origin, EA's Origin has the same thing. Uh, I forget what it's called, Origin Access or something. I think Lily's messed around with that a little bit before. Right? Have you? Didn't I have, you? yeah. It's, yeah. Um... It's basically the same thing. It's like a subscription. Right. And the same thing being, it actually gives you a subscription access to a bunch of AAA games, quote unquote, real games. Um, And that's why it's attractive. So Apple's adopted that same model, though I don't know who's the first one to start it, so it doesn't really matter. But the point is, it's this gaming subscription model where you don't have to go and buy each individual game. You pay a fixed amount and you just play whatever games you want. Great idea. But without some heavy-hitting games in the Apple Arcade library, it's never going to attract more than casual gamers. Uh, I think it's a great service. I'm glad it's there. Uh, It should be there. I just want to see more from Apple, you know? Like, go contract Feral or something, or whoever is doing these kinds of games porting, and be like, oh, cool, You you can subscribe for five dollars a month and bam you could play alien isolation or total war rome or or XCOM. like oh oh snap that would be pretty cool um why they don't they don't do that i don't know maybe it's licensing maybe it's the you know they've they've what do you call it canvassed a lot of developers for the apple arcade including a few exclusive games i forget what they are now because i'm bad with names and i didn't play them but i remember reading about them um so they're doing stuff um, I just want to see him do more. Like, in your opinion, Lily, as as someone who's used some of these bigger, like, big boy, big girl subscription services, like, what about them is attractive to you? And, like, obviously, like, 
would you ever use something like Apple Arcade? Well, I think the biggest thing with them is they usually, so usually the games you see on them are, are kind of outdated. Like they've at least been out for a few years. And the thing I like about that is that I get to play these games that I'm only going to pay, like play once. And then I'm probably never going to touch again. Right. And it's only like $5 a month. Whereas otherwise I would have to pay like $20 at minimum for one of these games because they're a triple A game. Right. I can't see the same appeal with non triple A games personally, because you're not getting that like price to, to reward if, if that, I mean, it's not like obviously a reward, but you, you get what I mean. It's like, you're not really saving anything in, in my opinion, unless it's a solid game. Right. It's like if if I'm paying five dollars a month and I'm only playing one game a month and the game is on the iOS market for like three dollars, <laughs> I'm like you know, and then oh maybe I get busy one month and now I just I I just spent five dollars on nothing basically. So right. Yeah, it's I don't know. Um, I I do think if Apple Arcade wants to stand up to the same business model that EA and uh, other companies are doing for whatever uh, I think. Uh, I don't know who else does that actually. <laughs> uh, Steam has Xbox that? has a pass. Sony uh, has yeah, a pass, pass. And Bethesda does something as well because they pulled yeah, all their games from GeForce Now. They used to be there, but they have oh. their own stuff. So Dishonored, Doom Eternal, Skyrim, whatever, Fallout 76, all that stuff was all on GeForce Now and I got yanked because they have their own streaming service of some kind. I think that's just Bethesda stuff. Or maybe it's because ZeniMax owns Bethesda, who also bought ID, who makes Doom and all that stuff. So maybe it's a ZeniMax thingy. Not entirely sure. Um, There are definitely a few different services. Yeah, there's like three major ones and a couple like much smaller ones, basically, I guess. Yeah. And so Mm -hmm. I I think it's like, how how much is Apple Arcade per month? I believe it's four ninety nine a month for US. Yeah, I don't know what those so might be it's, otherwise. It's five bucks. It's the same thing. Yeah. And like you can literally spend that much money for um EA and as as questionable of a company as EA is, at least they do give you that content. Yeah, and you can play Titanfall or Mass Effect and other stuff. You yeah. Know, like where you'd otherwise be going and spending, like you said, probably twenty dollars minimum, maybe more depending on the game. Um, but twenty dollars, and, and it's yeah. like good games too. Like you're yeah. getting some good bang for your buck out of that. Exactly, um, I would agree. I would agree. So, like this Game Pass stuff, I think, is, and in this, to be clear, this isn't like a streaming thing. You can just act, download the game to your computer and play it. Um, so Apple Arcade works the same way. I'm curious if there will be a future of these services where it kind of some sort of hybrid of like a GeForce Now idea, but also the Game Pass idea, you know what I mean? Where you kind of get both because GeForce Now you have to own the games first. So they don't get any revenue. You have to go and buy the game from Steam or GOG or whoever you might be buying it from Epic and stuff. Um, So I'm curious if one day there's more of a hybrid there where you just buy not, or yeah, you, you subscribe to a library of games. I think um, Google's, uh, not Google, sorry, Amazon's Luna. It's called Luna. Nice name, but crummy service. I was in the beta. Um, <laughs> I think they're actually doing something like that now that I think about it. I think you subscribe and get games. You don't have to buy them. Um, but they didn't have many games. The UI wasn't very good. The quality wasn't as good as GeForce Now or even Stadia, though I would never recommend Stadia because it's a closed system. Um, but yeah, Apple, um, you know, there's whispers in the air. They might do more with the new hardware and, you know, some of their executives, I think we mentioned last podcast or two were kind of gave some hints, but no clear answers or anything. They just keep saying there's a lot of gamer fans at Apple. So maybe it just means, yeah, we'll keep supporting Apple Arcade. Maybe that's all it means. (laughs) Yeah. Marketing stuff. Yeah. They've been saying that for so many years. (laughs) I, you know, I just, I haven't seen a whole, and and the thing is, it just gives, I think it gives Max a bad reputation because 
people think they don't have the power to do some of this stuff. And, you know, I personally, I mean, you know, I can flip my Intel iMac around to the Windows side and and play all the triple current triple A games and, you know, do a great job of it and not have any issues. I mean, you know. I know I play I like I said I've said before I play with my brother a lot and he'll often have a crash and I don't <laughs> and I'm I'm playing on a hybrid computer essentially right he has a you know a handmade but it you know I I like the quality of the machine the components that are in there are really top notch and people it just doesn't become apparent and so gamers say oh well it's probably just junk <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know? I like that you said that because I've actually found in most cases, um, at least from what I've used of PCs, that my iMac's a superior Windows machine. <laughs> it's well. true. I I've done the same thing. I you know and and it's. I mean, I have stories over the years of you know. I did a little bit. Of, I did a computer support when I was working, and um, you know, we bought two identical Dells at one time for servers, and they had different components in them. And we had to run, we had to do things differently on each one of them. Identical, but at the same time. And it was just like, that makes my head spin, right? You get two identical Macs, they're going to operate identically. And, yeah. uh, you know, to me, that's that's important. That means consistency. That means pre- predictability. And, you know, if you're a gamer, you don't want to... <laughs> Oh, geez, I got a, 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 well, that was, you know, you you probably all heard about the uh, issue with uh, New World when it first came out with mm. the graphic cards. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Well, you know, it, it all turned out to be that there were some bad solder joints in some of the graphic cards. Uh, okay, but weren't wasn't Amazon, like, forced to compensate people whose graphics cards were burned out or something? I, I or... thought I had read, and I don't quote me on this, but I thought I had read that it turned out to be a combination of the graphic, the, the manufacturer of the graphics card and Amazon because, because it turned out to be a flaw in the graphic cards themselves. And what was that? I forget which, uh, NVIDIA maybe? Um actually put out a statement saying yes there's a few graphics cards with these bad solder joints and we will replace them something to that effect i don't remember uh, the exact quote on it i remember okay, reading that yeah. going, it does yeah yeah they were blaming amazon initially but it does seem like it was actually nvidia's yeah in this case it was the super expensive nvidia 3080s it's like some yeah fifteen hundred dollar graphics card or something i know um, <laughs> and they were really hard to get and then people's they were burning out anyway it was burning like this out huge yeah fiasco um, yeah, because it was a rare, expensive item. So yeah, I'm not sure who compensated who in the end. Other than I think people, uh, people, gamers did eventually get replacements, but in some cases, I think some of them are still waiting because supply chain issues and stuff. So Might it's very like, well Yay, be, yeah. fancy new card, new game, new MMO, hooray! Card burned out. Oh my god, you know, <laughs> what a bummer. Hope they kept their like previous card as backup. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, I, I was really. A... Oh, go Sorry. ahead. Uh, I was I was actually thinking of upgrading my own graphics card because I'm I went over to the dark PC side. So, <laughs> well, that's okay. Uh, well, yeah, no, let's talk let's talk about GPUs a bit. What are you What do you have currently, and what are you thinking of getting? I have a 1080, so it's it's a couple years. I think it's like five years old now. Old um, reliable though, you know. It is old reliable. It is it is still very reliable, but very it's, respectable. It's just starting to falter. So I was thinking. Oh, I might, I might start looking for GPUs, and then like the 3080 is like impossible to get right now. So I thought, okay, maybe I can just get a 3070, and um, that's still like twice as expensive as it's actually marketed for. So right, yeah, it's not- yeah. It's, well, it's a little rough right now between C19 uh, delays. Or, or barriers plus uh, crypto scooping up GPUs mm-hmm. like crazy. Um, that's a separate topic, but I've I've gotten into a little crypto lately, a little investing and some learning, and and of course I was following kind of in tandem when the mining was going crypto mining was going crazy because it needs vast amounts of power to mine, especially like Bitcoin, the most prominent coin. Um, you know, and you can have whole. And the more you mine, the more you make, and blah blah blah. So, um, I mean, I remember I sold actually four old GPUs for a friend of mine because I have a, like a reasonable EB account with like a hundred feedback ratings. So, selling expensive stuff isn't shady, you know. Um, so occasionally I sell 
more expensive things, my buddies, tech stuff. Anyway, I had a friend who had tried out some mining. He had four, oh, I forget the name of the cards. It wasn't NVIDIA cards, they were AMD, Radeon, I don't know. They were like eight gig cards, I think. Uh, but they were like soup. They were so dusty. It was like someone had yeah. pulled it out of a, I don't know, a garbage dump or something. So I tried <laughs> to clean them up and sell them because, I don't know, he had some sitting in this like open dusty room for years and gave up on mining or something. Anyway, so I tried to clean them up. I, so I sold, they sold in like, I'm not, I don't know, 30 seconds, 60 seconds of me putting up the listing, not even kidding. <laughs> it was so ridiculous. And I think, and I think I priced them at 500 a piece. Um, which was reasonable, but like slightly over what they were worth. But def some crypto miner guy bought them up like just like that, and I was oh damn, I could have priced them for more. <laughs> um, you really should have. <laughs> yeah, well, they actually sold at a loss because my buddy bought them at a thousand a pop during the height of the mining craze, and I, so he only got half his money back. But they mined some coins, so they kind of broke even. You know, yeah. Um, but yeah, the point is, yeah, that I was so shocked at how fast they sold. And then the guy emailed me later, like, these are all dusty WTF. Um, you know, can't get them to work. I'm like, I'm sorry. I tried to clean them. I'll give you, you know, a return label if you want. But he's then he got back to me a week later, like, I took them all apart, dismantled them, cleaned them all up. Now they're working great for my farm. Thanks, you know, mining farm. So, <laughs> but it was weird that as, you know, gamers, we've kind of had this insulated, um, tech culture i guess i would say or like or like supply right you know um gpus powerful gpus were for gaming like right. specifically or like the gaming gpus there's obviously workstation gpus but we don't compete with them in terms of supply um you know for movie production and high-end photo editing and blah 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 they use different they use different cards in most cases anyway um because they're designed for different things so we never had to compete with anybody for like hardware before and suddenly like who are all these you know crypto nerds you know worldwide buying up our you know gaming supplies like wtf bro um it didn't really affect apple that much um but like the because you know we don't have you know nvidia 3080 cards sadly in our imax and whatever um yeah but it's, i just find it funny that we've been living in this sort of gamer bubble for a long time in terms of at least that's how i feel like where there was no one ever infringing on it or the supply chain or the parts no one we were all just buying it you know for ourselves and then this totally unrelated thing comes out and starts buying up a lot of the hardware i just found that very like funny and sort of interesting mm, i agree i want the uh i want the closed bubble back <laughs> yeah no i i liked the bubble i liked the closed bubble it was like safe and fun and reliable and you just kind of knew you know who was buying what and why and now it's like who you don't know who's buying what and why and causing shortages and all this stuff so um yeah so you uh the 1080 is a eight gig you have an eight gig version I think it's an eight gig card or do they have like a four and six gig version I don't remember I'll be honest. Sure. I mean, I'm looking. Oh, I guess it matters. I mean, I'm looking at it here. G is it a GTX 1080? Yeah, it's, you know? it's the NVIDIA. Okay. It should be an 8 gigabyte card then, which is still pretty respectable. Yeah. I mean, are you feeling some, uh, you know, decreased performance? Or do you just want to have like 4K, 120 FPS? Like, what's your... Game yeah, goals, I mean it's I it's more just like FPS. It's like I can't play games on with like the crisp graphics anymore. Right. Like I have to turn it all down. Um right. and then I'm also, you know, an Arma nerd, so every time mm. I play Arma, if I'm playing in a server that has like too many AI spawned in or something, then I can't see half the map and it's like, okay. <laughs> I guess there are people over there. I'll take your word for it. I can't right. see them. Yeah, that makes sense. I always enjoy personally as a gamer that there's like a particular game that makes me want to upgrade my computer um <laughs> so lily it's maybe something like it could be arma for you is there is there other games or just in general um I'm, i mean a couple other games i guess like the new halo i have to run that on low but i really oh, want to run it on high <laughs> halo Infinite, okay yeah free to play yeah. i'm wanting to check that out multiplayer i haven't will be tried that out yet yeah uh, the campaign will be paid I think that's a really interesting model, actually. They're releasing the multiplayer free-to-play, but if you want to play the campaign, 
then you can buy that. Right. And they're treating it as yeah. DLC on Steam anyway. It's listed as campaign DLC. It's like, what? That's like the entire game. It's like, well, if you only want to play the multiplayer, I mean, it's kind of like, um, I actually think it's a really smart model. And, and um, it's not Mac specific or anything. It's just like a game developer thing. And I think that's really clever. Um, I think uh, Activision did this with Warzone, Call of Duty Warzone. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, this was released the reverse. The game was released first with a campaign and regular multiplayer. And then they released the Battle Royale Warzone version for free. But eventually they separated the clients. So you could actually just download Warzone if you wanted. Because the download got ridiculous. It was like 250 GB for the whole thing. I mean, like, (laughs) jeebus. People were like... In fact, there was like an enormous, I think there was even a like hard drive shortage temporarily because people were like buying up extra hard drives just to install this whole like, you know, good to me, it's 25% of it. It's just ridiculous. It's almost, you know, 25% of a terabyte. Um, outrageous. But um, yeah, I think it's a really smart model to separate your game like that. And, you know, but they still have crossover systems. So in the case of uh, Call of Duty, uh, just Modern Warfare, the 2019 version, now they've already released two more, Vanguard and some other one. But Cold um, War, I think. Cold War, yeah, thank you. Um, but they all cross over. So if you've already played a bunch of the multiplayer paid version, you would have all those same unlocks and uh, you know whatever saved, uh, like kit loadouts you've made, you could just slide them right in the Warzone version. Um so I thought that was cool. It was like separate, but also there was some carryover progress. I appreciated that. I didn't play Warzone a bunch, but like my bu- a couple of my buddies got into it, so I got into it here and there. But again, these aren't Mac games, but it's like game develop from a game development perspective. I think that's really smart. Um, yeah, like parceling like the bigger sections of the game off because the truth is not everyone's going to want the campaign, not everyone's going to want the multiplayer. So why not separate right. it? Um, not- and as we all know, free to play, smartly done can make you far more money than paid. So, and of course, I think Fortnite was the king or queen of this with their battle pass system or whatever they call it over there. I think they make like $400 million a month off it, last I heard. Um, that's pretty bonkers. And it's like, oh, free to play game. So, if the game was paid, they wouldn't be making that much because people aren't. You only buy it once, and you're not necessarily buying and investing in the game anymore. It's better for the users to have the paid game up front in most cases. But um, the the flip side to this is you can also just play the free-to-play game and not invest in their battle pass or whatever pass system you want to call it for 10 or $20 a month or something. Um, you can also just play for free and unlock all kinds of stuff. So done well, like Destiny or Warzone or presumably Halo Infinite. Um, it's a smart system. Personally, I would be more interested in the campaign than the multiplayer, especially if there's like a, maybe a neat co-op version, like you can play the current Master Chief Collection co-op if you want. Way back when I was playing Halo on Mac with my, uh, my buddy growing up, we were like, damn, if only this had co-op, you know, we, we, we <laughs> would play side by side, like the camp, like we'd play the same level together, like at the same time, like not compete, but like kind of playing it together and we'd more or less be in the same areas and stuff. Um, of course, way later, there was a PC version. I forget what it was called. Uh, Halo CE, I believe, custom edition, where right. I think it did have co-op because the console version had co-op, I think only maybe local only. Local, yeah. Not yeah. online. Of course, yeah. now they do anyway, advancements in technology, but... I didn't mean to get off track with that. I was curious, Ted, uh, is there a game you can recall recently or in the past that has made you like want to upgrade your computer? Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> that's, um, <laughs> yeah, it, that's usually the reason why I do upgrade my computer. <laughs> right. You got um, a specific game or memory to relate? Some, something came out that I want to play that, um, you know, just doesn't work or doesn't work to my satisfaction on the current Mac. I mean, I think every Mac that I've upgraded with the, well, actually all of them, even, even when I had the, uh, the Mac pro um, and I was able to give it more life by buying a new graphics card for it. (laughs) 
<laughs> um, right, right. You know, after that got to a point, you know, it just became apparent that no matter how wonderful that thing was and how much fun it was to be able to expand all the stuff, it just didn't have the power anymore to do what I wanted to do. So I ended up sadly letting it go. But yeah, it was all, I think every... Every Mac I upgraded was because there was a, a of my main Mac, not my laptop, the laptop right. just, you know, for carrying around. But um, every one was because there was a game out there or something I wanted to do at the moment that I couldn't do because of the uh, limitations of the uh, hardware. And, you know, basically graphics or games. And then and, and that was, yeah, right. it was always graphics or games, you know, the ga- graphics of the games, I should say. Um so yeah, definitely. I, I used to be my my joke with my wife is like, oh okay, new game came out. Oh, I can't play it because it's max not powerful enough. Oh, I guess you're gonna go buy another one, huh? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I because, can see you're saying that. Yeah, yeah. It was it was just that it, you know all of them because I mean the I have friends you know in in my Mac uh, user groups that have been that they have these computers going back for ages. But right. they do internet and they do email and a ten, you know, a six, eight year old Mac will do that fine. Right, of course. <laughs> you know, it's it's really unless you're doing something high end like, you know, video editing, which I don't do, or gaming, that you know, there's a need to upgrade to something new. And right. I just wish there was a Mac that didn't cost, you know, as much as a you know, high end vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> you could right. upgrade you know like that mac pro i i just that was i adored that machine and you know if i had anything i could beg apple for it would be to come out with a consumer level upgradable and, yeah i miss the old towers i had a g4 tower uh, myself okay. actually I, uh, it was my brother's and i bought it off him when he moved out he moved okay away from home i don't know he, he went off to do his own thing um yeah, I think I bought it off him for like 500 bucks or something way back in, I don't know, 1990, I don't know, five or six, somewhere around there, 90s, yeah. mid-90s. Um, and I remember playing the original Deus Ex. Well, that was in 1999, I guess, but I had the computer before that. Um, and I remember upgrading it from 16 megabytes of RAM to 32. Hell yeah. Mm. And suddenly, like, <laughs> my game's loaded like twice as fast, and I got up some of the settings. It was like, whoa. You know, um, so that was a game I specifically upgraded for, I remember. Um, what else? A lot of really old school stuff, honestly. Uh, the original Myth games, Halo 1, Doom 3. A lot of these games, when I first played them, it was on ultra low settings, you know, it was the lowest resolution possible is the only thing I can manage on the computers I had. And then maybe one or two years later, I was able to get an upgrade or sometimes right away if I'd save some money or whatever. Because I was able to work as a kid for my uh, for my family and earn some cash, um, in some family businesses and stuff. So then I, I re- distinctly remember, you know, revisiting these games, or you know, or maybe a month or two later after acquiring a new device, and turn, you know, that moment of anticipation. You install it. Of course, back then everything was CD still, and uh, as you're punching in serial keys and whatever. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but then you go into the graphic settings and you turn them up to medium or high and then you like load into the game and like, oh, my God, this looks so much better. And oh, you know, yeah, like <laughs> been there. The lighting, <laughs> shadows, textures. And it's just like, holy crap, it's like totally different game. Um, yeah. Like you just said, graphics are games in most cases, unless you're maybe playing a pixel game. Anything that isn't like, quote unquote, retro game. Yeah. Like graphics are a large yeah. part of it. So, oh, um, yeah, those are fun fun stuff i don't know if there's uh i guess probably the last game i intentionally upgraded for was uh total war warhammer 2 just to have better load times i bought an uh, internal ssd on an imac which was really pricey but yeah <laughs> pretty worth it because it cut the load times down by like i don't know 60 70 percent or something silly like enormous so and uh, I like to play the battles, and those are the biggest loading times, loading in the battles and in, in War, Total War Warhammer. Maybe the Warhammer, maybe the Total Wars in general. I haven't played every single one. The Warhammers is the ones I really got into. Um, um, but then what I then because of course the Macs were less upgradable over time. Um, mm. Although you could still do the RAM hard drives if you were. Uh, technical <laughs> um but the gpu was i guess the gpus were always fixed outside of towers but 
I don't know, my, I didn't think about it as much before. So then I just started planning, okay, when I buy a new computer, I'm just going to buy the absolute best one available right. in terms of like iMacs or laptops. So then the graphics card and all that would last like four to five years. And so I wouldn't have right. to worry about it. So I yeah. stopped kind of having a game to upgrade hardware wise, but I would upgrade software wise, like new games like Feral and Aspire, for example, often required the latest Mac OS that I often wasn't on because I never upgraded unless I had a reason to. So I'm trying to, I don't know, launch uh, Tomb Raider or XCOM or whatever, or something. And it's like, oh, this requires, a, you know, OS X, whatever. I'm like, ah, shoot, got to upgrade. Um, right. But it is it is fun that, yeah, I mean, Apple would easily sell uh, a tower. And I mean, by easily, I mean, a lot of people would buy one, I think, a consumer level tower, like you said. Oh, yeah. Here's a question, Lily. You've gone over to the dark side, but let's just pretend here. (laughs) Let's just pretend. If Apple suddenly, I know they're not going to, let's just pretend, pretend land here, that they did like a consumer level tower that you could just, you know, chunk in a, you know, hulking graphics card in and stuff. I guess the problem is still the game support, right? Because, you you know, a bunch of most yeah, of what game you're playing support, is... But if we were to assume um, that Apple was going to do that, yeah, I would be 100% down to, um, to, to start looking at Max again. But right. I think just, just because... The, the biggest thing for me with um, the PC world is that you can just pop something in if if there's something that needs an adjustment. Like, hmm. it, and it doesn't take much work at all. Whereas with Macs, it's like, if you need to upgrade something, you need to upgrade the whole system. And that can yeah. get a little that can get a little pricey. <laughs> like yeah, even even yeah. though right now there's this whole issue with the graphics cards being driven up in price and all that, it's still not as pricey as going out and buying a new system every couple <laughs> of years. <laughs> right. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah, I, I think that's something I would like to see from Apple definitely is you know, more modularity, more um ability to upgrade on your own without having to go out and completely change your system. Yeah. And I agree um, completely because even if you don't necessarily have plans at the time of when you buy said machine, like a tower, uh, it gives you the option in the future and that's comforting. You just know down the line, oh, I could swap out this or upgrade that or tinker with this if I wanted to, even if I don't have a need right now or a game right now I got to upgrade for. Well, maybe I do in a year or two or three. Uh, And that's obviously really attractive. Um, Though with Apple's, uh, you know, the silicon direction, that's unfortunately like kind of puts a nail in that coffin because now you can't even touch the RAM. Everything's right. unified, uh, so it's it's going down. The trend is it's going down, not up. Um, you know, a while ago you could still swap out batteries. Boop, that went out. You know, you could still swap out. Uh, I guess I don't know what the new silicon machines. If you can mess with the hard drives, I'm unclear about that, honestly. Because um, you know, even on an iMac, you can tinker with the hard drive. It just requires you to have like suction cups to pull the mo- the monitor glass off, and this whole you know <laughs> this whole shenanigans. It's quite involved, but I've done it once or twice. Not on my own. I was helping out some friends. <laughs> um, <laughs> so possible, but tricksy. So it's like, yeah, I'm unclear. So the batteries went away quite a while ago. Now the RAM's out. I don't know about the hard drives. And of course, the GPUs have never been swappable outside of the towers. And that's um, the thing as well, is that, like, like you mentioned, even for things as simple as, like, um, swapping out uh what what was the storage you said yeah yeah like that's still like you you said you need to have these tools it's a little tricky and and with like i'm not the most hardware oriented person there is so being able to just pop open my computer tower and slide in the ram in the nice like you know slot that it's specifically designed for is like (laughs) like even an idiot could probably get this you know 
Yeah, it's uh, intuitive and easy at a glance, or you could just look up a really quick YouTube video or something if you were unsure. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, like tinkering with that stuff in an iMac requires like hours of work, uh, mm-hmm. a whole toolkit because you actually need like new glue strips and all this shit to uh, get your screen back on. And I knew a friend who actually slightly actually did it for his mom, upgraded her. She was uh, doing some like graphic design and artist stuff. I don't know. He upgraded her hard drive and RAM or something. Um, and he put her screen on a little wrong. <laughs> so for like quite a long time, her screen was slightly offset the glass and they didn't like fix it till later. So it's not even as simple as, oh, it's difficult. It's actually possible to like mess it up. And they yeah. give you all these, and you have to, I think, disconnect the motherboard. It's 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 not as simple as just taking off the screen and oh, I can just slot on the RAM or hard drive. Oh, of course, the RAM's accessible on the back in the IMAX, uh, the old the Intel ones at least. Um, yeah, if you want to mess with their hard drive, it's this whole thing. You have to disconnect multi. You basically have to like disconnect the whole computer to get at the hard drive. It's a whole trip, yeah. really really tough. And then put it all back together correctly without like ruining anything. And then putting the monitor back on with like these new glue strip thingies, it's like wow, what a hassle. Um, so I do, actually, yeah. I still have a G4 tower. This G4 tower I mentioned, it's actually in my attic. I still have it. <laughs> um, I don't know the last time I used it, and I don't have a monitor for it. I actually want to like go buy a cheap monitor or something at Staples. I don't know, fifteen hundred dollars <laughs> or whatever. I guess or off Amazon or something, and see if I can get it to work because that would be rad. Because it's yeah. just like mega old machine i could do some like super old gaming on it or something i don't know i haven't i haven't tried <laughs> but i do uh, i have the box it's in its old you know original box has the power cord i don't even remember if i upgraded it anymore like what the specs were at the time i just know it's a g4 tower not a g5 um that was yeah. the old uh bluish colored thing right yep correct yeah, yeah. i think it might be a graphite one actually oh the they... graphite graphite right yeah yeah yeah, got the, yeah, yeah. Got the graphite the blue one. was the yeah the max right okay yeah the uh like the g3 imax and stuff that sort of turquoisey yeah. blue yeah um so yeah, evolution of hardware is interesting and you can't deny apple has like a sexy form factor i mean you could deny it i guess but most people agree they're pretty good looking um but what you know they uh, you know, they gain in elegance, they lose out big time in, you know, just functionality and this ease of use, like Lily was talking about, just to pop over my computer, slot stuff in and out. Um, and I know there's still some Mac gamers out there who are using those like 2009 towers, um, cause they still yeah. can't upgrade the GPU and the RAM and the hard drive and everything. The, uh, CPUs are obviously feeling their age now, though you, I think you, back then you could have bought a, I don't know what core Xeon or whatever it was. You could buy a pretty hefty CPU depending on what you invested in. Yeah. I guess maybe it's even possible to replace the CPU on those if you're really technical. I guess I'm not clear. I um, think there was a possibility of doing that. I, you know, I thought about actually doing that, but ended up deciding not to. Right. On the E5. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, a lot of people would like it, but. I, I guess it would go against, well, now it not only goes against Apple's like merged unified hardware philosophy of Silicon, where like the RAMs merged and the GPUs merged and all this stuff. So it's giving us like the level of performance we want. The M1 Pros and the M1 Maxes, their performance is really strong, um, even on non-optimized games, just running stuff through Rosetta, really strong performance, great power, but still comes at the cost of you no know, basically zero accessibility can't even mess with your ram so now you really have to buy the computer you want up front before it was like i never buy the ram up front i always do that later and order a third party right. <laughs> um from like owc or something other world computing or, or whatever um and that was fun i like tinkering with the hardware a bit i actually used to fix friends laptops as a as like a hobby honestly i was like the tech guy in our in our community so I've done all sorts of crazy stuff with computers a long time ago, and I kind of missed that. And now it's, like, kind of boring. You just get this ultra all-in-one machine with, like, okay, it has super high performance, but you can't tinker with it anymore. I mean, okay, if I was really next-level nerd, I could maybe dismantle them, but I'm not that good on the new ones. I, I wouldn't try that. I'm only familiar yeah. with the old hardware. So it's kind of sad in a sense, I guess. It's, like, an, truly the end of an era. We have this oh, next-gen yes. hardware with silicon, which is very impressive, um in many many ways but it's like 
you know, really putting that final nail in the accessibility coffin. Like, can't even adjust the RAM. Feels good, man, but also feels bad, man, at the same time. Um, so, yeah. Good days, but, you know, this is, progress is inevitable. But I guess, yeah, because a lot of PC towers are like these giant gargantuan boxes of metal or whatever um, <laughs> that don't necessarily look like sleek because Apple's all about minimal minimalizing their profile and their size and everything and it's like sure they're suddenly going to come out with some chonky tower <laughs> I wish they would but it goes against their ethos or whatever you want to call it design design factors yeah in a yeah. sense but I yeah. think in it's also part of there's a bit of planned obsolescence in there. I, I oh, would right. say. No, I'm glad you brought that up. That's fair. Um, um, yeah. Like, th- there's definitely that motivation of they get more money if people upgrade their entire system. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's the same undeniable. design philosophy behind the iPhones and how you know it came out a couple, not not too long ago. It was like a few years where the updates would purposefully throttle the iPhone's battery right? so that people would be compelled to update their systems. Mm-hmm. I've yeah. noticed that. My brother and mother have noticed that before. They'd update and complain, like, what's up with my battery? And <laughs> maybe it's time to get a new phone. Yeah. Um, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, we like Apple around here in general, but like any company, they're a company, and companies got to make money. Um, and some of them do it in... I wouldn't call Apple shady personally. Maybe some other people would. Um, I would. But are they, you know, do they do some stuff that's really obviously for profit and not for users? Yes. Do I like that? No, I wish they wouldn't do that. I think it's lame. It's kind of low end. Maybe not kind of. It is. Um, Are they the worst? No, they're not the worst. Um, They aren't, like, horrible. But they do have some self-serving, like, like Lily was just saying with the batteries, some self-serving uh, practices. Um, but, you know, it's also made them the richest company in the world. So, you know, there's that. Although I guess something like Microsoft might have overtaken them in an evaluation. Sam was talking about that. But they were the richest company in the world by, like, cash. I don't know. How, I don't know what metric is used there. Maybe they're still the most valuable company in the world or something. I don't know. Well, they have the most available like liquid like money to spend liquidity assets whatever whatever it is so it's undeniably made them ludicrously wealthy um and do they treat users pretty well they do could they treat them better they could um should they yes will they probably not (laughs) 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 because people you know uh speak with your wallets right most corporations won't change anything until people speak with their wallets. And we can, um, we only have a few minutes left here, maybe five or 10 um, on, on the on the show or keeping it under an hour or so. Um, let's talk about that really quick. Um, this idea is segueing into a totally different topic of, uh, have you guys followed up at all on this like Activision Blizzard harassment stuff been going on? You know, it was in the news some months ago and it's kind of resurfaced maybe this last week or two. Yeah, I've I've seen it a bit. Um and I I'm the whole thing at least for me, um maybe because I've been in similar situations like no shame in that. I'm I'm in the army, you know, some people are scumbags, that's how it goes. Sexism mm. is everywhere. But I I personally feel that Activision's response was kind of weak. Um mm. And I feel like there needs to be like if if you have sexism in the workplace and you have people being like straight up sexually harassed in the workplace, yeah, that's like that's not a we're looking into it response. That's a you know <laughs> we yeah we deplore this sort of activity. We do not expect this from our company like employees. You know something that gives that message of yeah this is a problem. We know it's a problem. We're addressing it. Not yeah. this sort of like we're looking into it. Like we'll, we'll get was, back to you later. Like yeah. maybe <laughs> it's like I mean, and I, I know some people will scream cancel culture, and that's just how it goes. But I I prefer to call it accountability culture 
Like mm. if you if someone fucks up, they got to they got to answer for that. Like it's got to be Right. There has to be consequences. Absolutely. I would agree with that. Right. Um cancel culture can be real, though in the case of Activision, I don't think I exactly what you said accountability is key here. Yeah. Um yeah, they had a lot of really weak responses. Morst Kemp stuff came out um cuz the president stepped down and then um, this lady, Jen O'Neill, and another guy were made co-leaders or something of Blizzard. But then a few months later, she stepped down. And in, up front, she was like really professional about it. But it came out more later, like a week or two ago or maybe this week even. Like she was getting paid less uh, than her you know, co-leader counterpart who was a guy. Uh, when she asked about that, they like told her like, eh, it's just your contract too bad. We can't pay you more or something stupid. And then she also, you know, she was trying to champion, you know, this accountability you were talking about Lily and she was basically ignored. So she just left after yeah. a couple months. Right. And it's like, oh, great. You know, that's, that's not good. And then, um, came out just also recently, Bobby Kotick, who's not part of Blizzard per se, but he's head of Activision and Activision merged with blizzard so take that what you will um apparently he even threatened to kill someone like long ago in a weird voicemail and uh so he's getting in like major hot water for that uh was it even it might have even been her it might have even been jen o'neill um but she was also harassed and all this stuff's coming out so but the reason I'm segueing into this is because I talked about like voting with your wallet right like these companies don't really change until well well i guess two things can happen it's the you know us the consumers the gamers buying their stuff or not and two um the employees themselves have staged huge strikes and walkouts and they're demanding a lot of accountability and stuff like this so between the two they'll probably be forced to make some changes how much who knows you know it's not enough to be like oh we fired the guy or guy it's almost in most cases it's a guy in rare cases it's a lady who's the problem um They've stepped down, they've resigned, they've been fired, or they've been moved to another position, and I think that's what happened in one of these cases. Like, they didn't get fired from the company, they were just, like, let go of their position, but they were still with the company. So yeah. that's kind of lame, that's like a that's like a cop-out. Um, so, like, yeah, is there is there an answer? No, but the accountability should be real, um, in my opinion, and people should be vocal, should, people should be aware, you know... I used to really like Blizzard, but I think they've gone down the drain in more ways than one. Mm. Not just their obvious, like, bad, like, company culture, but I think their their game quality's gone down the drain, too, uh -huh. um, in a lot of cases. They, they don't make bad games, but they don't make amazing games like they used to, you know? Yeah, the, the so. recent WoW uh, expansions were what made me stop playing the game, like, straight oh, up. Me me too. <laughs> I, like I, Legion felt like such a callback to Wrath of the Lich King, and then the next game, the next one, what was it? BFA came out, and I was like, okay, this just the story doesn't make sense. The gameplay feels like somehow they made the classes feel worse, and like I just don't like where this is going. Yeah, but um, yeah, that that accountability, so. I'm happy to see that, you know, get, you know, like game journalism media is trying to take them to task. The a lot of Blizzard employees are trying to take them to task. Um there's a lot of support in the gamer community like, oh, you know, we're going to boycott Blizzard. So yeah, like Lily said some could say, "Ah, cancel culture," but I think yeah. that can have its place, but I you know, the cancel culture makes it just sound Well, yeah. What do you, but, like bad. cancel culture like, is like Oh, this guy on Twitter said this artist is bad. Go like dox him. Like Right, yeah, exactly. It's not it's or you not, made a mean hey, tweet. They're they're getting you mad because they harassed women. That's cancel culture. Right. Like, <laughs> like you, you sent a mean email twenty years ago, we should like burn you huh? to the ground. Yeah, that's cancel culture. So yeah, accountability is important and more companies should institute strong or even like zero tolerance policies for this kind of stuff because yeah. Unfortunately, scumbags exist everywhere, and we won't be able to get rid of them. You can only basically make it very difficult for them to be scumbags, or basically impossible. Or if yeah. they are a scumbag, well, then boom, they're gone. They're fired. Yeah. They're they're out. You know, whatever. 
um, heavy, heavy penalty for that. Or in some cases, serious enough, yeah, they should be, you know, prosecuted, go to jail, etc. Um, so none of us here are lawyers or anything like that. But, um, no, the accountability should be there. So I'm not like a big like boycotter per se. Um, but I, I mean, I guess the main reason I don't plan on getting any Blizzard games is because I think their games have gone downhill. But it's also then in the back of my mind, like, I'm seriously questioning, like, do I even want to support these guys? Not right now. But then there's this other problem is, problem, if you want to call it that, the other uh, side of this lens, and I'll have Ted comment on this, see what he thinks, is like, okay, we're, the main issues are with the management. That's the accountability failing. The average employee isn't some scumbag. Mm -hmm. um, and they're there just trying to live, you know, their dream or their whatever as a game developer um, designer, what have you, you know, whatever job you might have at a company like Blizzard or pay, take your pick could be whatever game company that is. Um, so are we hurting them by boycotting the company that's not being accountable enough? I kind of wonder about that, you know? Um, yeah. it's, it's like a catch 22, but yeah. what do, I don't know. What do you think, Ted? I, I, I think, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, <sighs> It, it's a hard call because, you know, when a company does something like that, it, it's not a good thing. But a company is a group of a lot of people, like you pointed out. And, you know, the artists, the the uh, designers, the, you know, the sound people, they, they're the ones that are going to ultimately get hurt. And the executives that made all the real mistakes are probably going to get a separation package if they get dumped. <laughs> yeah. The, oh, yeah. You know the the artists that you know the all the the you know the the real talent in the company, they're going to go bye bye. You know if the company goes under, they're going to go away, and that's going to be the end of it. And you know they're going to have to go find something, and, and that's that's kind of the sad thing. But the other side of the coin is, you know, um, if the management doesn't get the the, the um, the artist people, the, the develop, you know, the, the creative people to, you know, to really come up with something really good or give them the ability to do that. I don't know where it's what's going on with, you know, uh, Blizzard internally, because it seems like their creativity, their imagination, the thing that really drew me into WoW originally kind of like left. And they're just kind of making sequels that, we feel like really bad sequels as opposed to new and exciting expansions and at mm -hmm. least in the wild respect and i you know some of their other games i haven't tried because other than diablo which the uh you know they uh haven't really come out with anything that worked on the mac it was just you know wow and then there was diablo but then they started releasing old games again. It's like, okay, we don't know what to do, so we're just going to re-release old <laughs> old games, and you know, people will continue playing them, so they'll pay for the service. And um, you know, it got to a point where I realized it's not going anywhere. But that's you know, but where is that? You know, and the thing is, the where I was going with that is, is that coming from the executives, not really letting the developers and the creative people do what they need to do? Or is that mm. the creative people just saying, I'm bored, I have a job, I'll just keep working until somebody sends me off? I don't know the answer to that. but That's a really interesting point. Yeah. Yeah, oh. like who's, whose idea is it to like release a tsunami of remasters across the right. industry, let alone Blizzard? <laughs> yeah. A lot of people are doing it. Um, I mean, there's some room for that, uh, I think, you know, especially... Um, you know, a lot of our cases, we played all these original games that are being remastered. Maybe not in every single case, but a lot of cases. Uh, but then there's gamers or, you know, newer gamers, maybe they only got into gaming a couple of years ago or, or this year or whatever. And, oh, they could maybe go back and experience like an old game updated. That's cool. Um, but that should never come at the cost of like what you were saying, creating new and exciting stuff. Um, well, exactly, this topic, yeah. yeah, this topic ultimately deserves probably its whole own podcast, but I wanted yeah. to touch upon yeah. it. Um, because it's been floating around internally, by which I mean our our team, like in notes, ideas, topics. I just wanted to start chatting about it a little bit. 
um, throw it out there. Maybe we'll get some feedback um, from some listeners or some forums or something. I'll kind of poke around that, see what some people think. Uh, or maybe when we get Sam and Casper on, we can kind of have a part two discussion or something. Um, but that'll pretty much be it for today. We had some fun talks on hardware and uh, history and uh, you know what makes us upgrade and a little bit on... I don't know what you want to call it. Accountability is, yeah, accountability culture. That is fantastic. I mean, never mind gaming. That should be everywhere. That's just like a, that's like a life thing. It's not a gaming thing. <laughs> it just so happens to yeah. be yeah, coming out more and more in the gaming like news. Oh, like heavy developer crunch. You know, maybe there's actually quite a bit of like, yeah, harassment culture in certain companies. And um, it's not unique to gaming. It's just sad that it also happens in our gaming space when the end of the day we just want to be like chill nerds playing games and hanging out or in right. the case mm-hmm. i guess in the case of the people actually making them you know they're all individuals too with like they're just trying to have a good time and and make make you know most cases pouring their heart and soul into it trying to make a great game right. it may not always succeed but like you know yeah so the fact that harassment or abuse or whatever comes along and anything of that nature comes along and uh, puts a ruins that or puts a huge damper on that is a bummer. So, um, but the good news is we are seeing in general more like more support for this accountability that Lily was talking about. It's like, there's much more of a bigger push from it. I would say in the last couple of years in general, like in the world in general um, and online. So I think that is a good thing. Um, it's not going to solve anything overnight, but there is more of a push and there's more support for it. There's more pushback from employees of these companies as well. We never really saw that before. It's like en masse, like, you know, uh, you know, hundreds of employees staging walkouts or protests and, uh, uh, you know, more, more gamers themselves being willing to maybe, you know, hold off on, you know, basically support them as well by maybe uh, either just talking about it or uh, maybe they, you know, oh yeah, I'm not gonna... I know a bunch of people who uninstalled a bunch of Blizzard games because of this, actually. Um, kind of interesting. So, or at least they're gonna say, like, well, I'm not, I'll am not. i keep playing their games, but I won't spend any more money on them, because a lot of their stuff's free to play. Or maybe, you know, they bought it one time. So, yep. We all have, you know, whatever, wh- whatever you want to do individually, that's up to you, but... Um, I'm just saying I, I see the, the there's positive support for it and forcing these corporates to make changes, well, sometimes can be messy. So we'll see where it goes. Yeah, definitely agree with all those points. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. This was Mac Gamecast episode 19. And now we'll, we're wrapping up. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks for being here. Thanks for right. listening. Shortest podcast ever. Hello, goodbye. Uh, thanks for listening. <laughs> thanks for being here. And we'll see everyone next week. Okay. All right. Yep. A big thank you to Kevin McLeod for the intro and outro music. Be sure to check out his library on the web. You can find more episodes of our show on our website, macgamecast.com, or in all major podcast directories. If you enjoy the show, please consider commenting, following, or sharing. Thanks again for listening, and see you next time.